The BSA now has um, a small collection of Leo, Lego classicist figures, and we, uh, that is uh, our figures, took the advantage of a sunny day in Athens yesterday for a photo shoot. And you'll see me second from right there, holding the BSA logo, our assistant director, Michael Loy, to the left of me, as you look at it, and to the left of Michael, Sir Arthur Evans, uh, the excavator of the site of Knossos. Behind us, you'll see the award, which sparing my own blushes, uh, was made last year to the Lego Classicist of the Year, uh, and made, uh, I hasten to add, in person um, by Constantinos Vasiliadis of the Acropolis Museum. And on the far right is the Lego Classicist himself, Liam Jensen, visiting uh, from Australia. Being a Lego Classicist in the BSA Garden can be a traumatic experience, uh, as my alter ego found when confronted uh, rather unexpectedly with a giant tortoise uh, yesterday. Anyway, Liam is not only in this picture uh, in his Lego persona, but he is live down under, uh, thanks to the wonders of teleconferencing. Uh, and he's uh, ready to give us a behind the scenes look uh, at, the, at Lego Classicist Central. Now, I'll just add very quickly that um, Liam will hopefully answer all of your questions in the course of his talk. Um, but uh, if you'd like to pose questions to him, please use the Q&A feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen um, uh, to, to write your questions in, and I will pose those uh, to Liam uh, towards the end uh, of our event. And we do plan to finish, by the way, uh, on the hour in case uh, you have other things that you need to be doing uh, this lunchtime, evening or afternoon. Um, also feel free to use the chat feature to talk to one another, exchange uh, responses and ideas and so on. Um, but it's the Q&A that we'll, we'll monitor for actual questions. So I'll now hand over to you, uh, Liam. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, welcome to an early start to International Lego Classism Day. Um, and I guess I should really start off with saying what is International Lego Classism Day and why I started it. Uh, actually, answer, I think it's important to actually say the second thing first, because I really started it as, um, I guess, for want of a better phrase, an ironic joke. Um, I had been doing Lego classes for a year at this point when I first thought of it, and I just thought it'd be a cute, nice reason to celebrate one year. And I suggested to um, a university um, at the time who were the majority of the family members that we should have an afternoon tea party. And they said, that's a wonderful idea. So we started it that day and it's been happening every year ever since. And every year I like to request an institution um, dealing with primarily the classical discipline to host the event and this year I'm very 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 pleased that it's the BSA in the part of the world that is dearest to my heart. I'm just so very sorry due to international historical circumstances of the world that I can't be there as planned but um, I think and the point um, that I decided to use for International Lego Classism Day instead of it just is although it was as way of celebrating the first anniversary at the beginning or indeed every anniversary. I didn't want it to make it an egotistical anniversary. I wanted it more of a reason, an excuse, a, another alternative way of exploring the ancient history world through the magic of the Lego brick, whether it is using having um, Lego figures taken photographs of Lego figures taken in front of, taken to actual historical, ancient historical locations, or whether it's building your own interpretation of a building, a location, a historical event. And over the course of the last five years, I've seen the most amazing things I could have never expected when I just came up with this idea at the beginning. So that's what International Lego Classicism Day is, but I guess there may be quite a few people asking why Lego figures and why connect them to classicists and ancient historians. And that is a far more complicated question in many ways, as um, what started off as just a simple gift to one good friend of, um, good friend of family and 
colleague and as I was a young um, beginning archivist at the time, I just came across some pieces that reminded me of this person and I gave them the figure and a photograph got taken and it got put onto Facebook. And then the next thing I know, people were saying, oh my God, I know him, can I have one? And although it started by accident in such a strange organic way, it made me very quickly realize how powerful this little figure was. I hope that kind of sort of explains that part of the things, but I've just continued it on from then, um, making other people that I know directly through my work or through people I've heard of. And it slowly grew in um, knowledge of, I'd have people contact me who I've never heard of before and say, oh, I work in the industry and I just really love Lego and I would like to be a figure. And it's just been a very slow but organic process like that. I hope that answers that part of the question at least. But I thought given the circumstances as um, John's mentioned is through the magic of the technology of what we've got access to and the circumstances that is the only way we can do this talk. I also thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to introduce a big chunk of the audience who um, have, I have had um, contact me at different points of how I make these things and how I create and decide. I thought it'd be a good opportunity given that I'm already in the location I make them to give you a very, very quick um, tour of my home and workspace as, um, as the Lego classes and indeed as an archivist as well. I'll show you a couple of the things that I create. So um, my brother, Jesse is actually helping me tonight and he'll actually follow me around the room. So if we can get this done, it might be interesting. So we'll start with the obvious, which I think some people have already seen is what I refer to as the wall of fame. We've got up here, the most notable people with their Lego selves. And of course we have got if you excuse me for a second, we've got John Bennett, of course, up here. Michael Loy, is, I'll just move my lamp out of the way. We've got up here. And um, potentially other notable people we can talk about. Uh, Michael Scott, of course, over here. And, and of course, the um, some that you may not know of, but you would know their work, or at least have heard of their work, is the people who have worked on Ubisoft's very well-known classical video game, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. We've got um, the people, the major directors who worked on that game. And um, to continue on from, uh, John Bennett's already mentioned that last year he was Lego Classicist of the Year, something that I do, I've done since the, I think it was the second year I started that as, again, just a way of honoring people I think have done particularly interesting work in engaging with the audience. It's not so much the power of their work itself in academia, but it's how they engage with the audience, which is, I think is very important about what Lego classicists represents is the engagement. So last year was John Bennett um, got classicist of the year, but before that we've got um, Stephanie Ann Ruata, who is the historian behind the video game Assassin's Creed Odyssey. She's tirelessly, tirelessly, was in, responsible for all the high level data that they put into such an immense open world video game that has in such an engaging way um, allowed children and young adults engage with the ancient world. Uh, then we've also got, uh, let's see, of course, the second person who ever in, um, joined the family who in many ways is the major inspiration for Lego classes is uh, Michael Turner who was the senior curator of the Nicholson Museum here in Sydney, Australia, but he's responsible for something you may, you may have not heard of him necessarily, but you would have heard of some of his work. He's responsible for the three classical Turner Lego models that were commissioned by the museum while he was senior curator. And one of those models is in Athens, as we speak at the Acropolis Museum, as it was donated to the museum. And it's an amazing model showing so much information that goes beyond just using a children's toy. So 
that's the wall of fame of course but i'm sure you've already just saw in the camera angles the actual family itself because i do keep every time i create one member to the family i send one to the person themselves and then i also keep one for the actual family archive so here on display at my place is actually the entire family and at, at the moment it's over 100 figures are in the family uh, you will notice that one person is missing. Jesse, if we can actually zoom in here, we've got one person missing here, of course, is John Bennett, because he's actually sitting on top of the camera right now. So then I can make appropriate eye contact to you all. So I am addressing Lego John Bennett as we speak. So, how do I make them? Well, I'll first show you a little bit of the work, that, the background work that I go into. So, since 2016 was the first figure that came out. Of course, I'll just order parts as I need to. But as this has become a regular thing, I very quickly needed a backlog of um, content to get inspired by every time I get suggested someone or if I think of someone to create, I first go to my Lego Classicist toolkit. This is the basic toolkit that I just go with. I, fun, I mostly stick to getting a variety of heads. As you can see, Lego produces. And I do only use genuine Lego parts, um, primarily par and primarily printed with original faces, patterns, whatever Lego produces. I try to stick to what Lego actually produces. And as you can see, they have got a variety beyond belief. So most of the time, I've, I'm spoiled for choice. However, of course, on occasion, I do find myself needing something just a little bit more specific and literal, although I actually I shy away from the word literal and I'll explain why later. Sometimes I need something a bit more specific than what Lego has. For instance, uh, we shall use an example of one of my more, although not a Lego class as a family member, I also produce some comical, interesting alternatives to other historical figures, including this figure here, who is Lego Igia for the modern age. She has got a face mask, gloves, and hand sanitizer. And of course, still representing the snake on her arm there. The torso and skirt legs, I guess we could say, are completely, the image is completely designed by myself. And I'll show you how I'll do that in a second. But occasionally I need to actually get these things custom made. And the way that I do that is I design the patterns myself on a computer. I'll show you that more in detail in a second. And then I, this one, uh, I actually did myself through a process of using a laser printer transfer system. However, this is only something I've used this year because of the situation of the world pandemic. Because the actual way I do it is I go to a company in the United Kingdom who will, will actually print your specific designs onto Lego parts as though the Lego parts are like printed onto paper. Then they send them back to me here in Australia, then usually I have to send them back to Europe. So as you can imagine, quite a lengthy process. That's why I had to resort to this process for this specific figure. But thankfully the company that I go to who tirelessly print all the parts that I require when I need them are still in business and are still going strong. So I, there'll be more figures coming very soon. Now, the way that I actually design I usually start with very simply in hand, just drawing a basic sketch. I keep to basic dimensions. More often than not, I just do the torso section this time in particular because of the year. We can see what we are before and after. This is actually the original design in pencil. After I draw it, just if you can follow me to the computer and I'll show you where I do this section. I then scan it into the computer and then using a drawing software, I'll then draw, and we'll just do a magical, the final product over the top of it. So you simply trace over the top digitally the original image. Then through this, I turn into a final image 
to then either be sent off to the printing company, or in this case, as I said, I used a home transfer, laser printing transfer process. So as you can tell, um, it can be quite time consuming just in the physical process itself. But that's not taking into account, of course, the actual um, creative process that it requires because I have been asked several times, how long does it take to create a Lego figure? And the answer is how long is a piece of string? And I know it's a phrase that's used way too often, but it's so very true, particularly in these figures. Because it can be anything from I'm inspired straight away, I find the pieces straight away, and it just works. However, then there can be um, people with such subtlety in their appearances that they end up just looking like Emmett from the Lego film if you overly simplify things. And to get that level of simplicity while still drawing in the person's personality can be a surprisingly difficult thing. Um, Jesse, if you just follow me for a second, because I'll give you an example of someone in particular, and then we'll talk about the actual creativity that has to go into it. Say with, oh, I'm trying to think of a good example here now. And I've lost my place with all these figures. Let's, do, let's use good old Professor Andrew Wallace Hadrill. So, got the professor here. In many ways, it is very, very complex in its simplicity because we've got in the final piece, we've got a very obviously humanoid um, figure, but the actual piece is made up of simply in its most basic format, four pieces of plastic. We've got the head, the torso, the legs, the hair. Through four pieces, I have to bring across a human being. And also we're dealing with not just that, it's, and this is why I said, I think I'll take away the word um, literalness. The Lego figure is fundamentally a form of caricature. So to have too much literal meaning in it, like make the facial features too exact, like imagine if I actually drew a literally correct human face upon a Lego head, it would look ridiculous. So it's about what's not there that brings out the human behind the figure. And this is why, I know it sounds like I'm going around about in circles, but this is exactly goes what goes through my head every time I'm thinking about making another person into a Lego figure, is because it is a very, very subtle, careful balance of getting the features, whether it is literally the features of their face or whether it's a mannerism of the types of clothes that they wear, style, hair, color of their hair is actually I find the most fascinating pieces, um, uh, things that get the color of the hair wrong, it looks completely different, even though if you get the hair shape right. So I find myself, and this is where the time does go in because I can think I've got it right, get the pieces in, put it together, and it's only in the putting together that I actually can tell it's right. And fingers crossed, I get it right. I then let the, um, let the person know they've got their figures ready and send it off to them. However, I can think I've got it right, put the pieces together, and I'm just going swing and a miss. And it can be months or years sometimes. I have had a figure that's taken me over a year, not because of the time that it takes to have pieces sent to Australia or, or how long it takes to draw the new custom image. It's just the, the trial and error because I can think I know what I want, but only when it comes together in the physical reality that it is, that I know it's right. So it can be a process of again and again and again and again. Now, before I ramble on too far, I think, I'm sorry, where is, ah, Thank you. Ah. 
just want to go double check my list here. I think I've covered up most of the, I mean, unless, uh, unless there's any specific questions to that. The next thing is a lot of people requ um, request to know, as um, you've all seen the photographs, or I'm assuming a, big, uh, a majority of you have seen the photographs of the classic orange and cream penguin, popular penguins that always turn up. I've had a lot of people ask, was that a theme that I chose from the beginning? And the answer is no, I took the first photograph on my bookshelf. So this is where I take the, the photographs. It is, as you can see, just my bookshelf of my penguin, popular penguins of a collection that I haven't added to in many years because that's just the collection I had back then. And I've purposely kept it the same ever since we started this because it becomes a very good backdrop. Jesse, if you want to get as far back as possible as we can, so we can see, so the audience can actually see, it's very much just a bookshelf. And it is all part of the same organic process, is nothing was planned. I just followed the, followed the direction of the response. I take a photograph, I make a figure, people like it. I continue because, and then I get a request and someone else likes that too. And what has happened is something I could have never, ever, ever predicted. And it's something far more beautiful as a human connection because I have actually literally found myself, I call it the Lego classes as family, but I mean that very literally, a family because I've seen connections between members of the family who didn't know each other before and including people I have met literally from turning them to Lego figures and then I'm now developing very interesting and strong connections of both friendship and, co and working on projects with them. So the term family is not one used lightly. It is most genuine at this point. And I could have never predicted such a thing through the engagement of such a simple little toy. Now, another thing is a lot of people also ask me, is this what I do for my living? And no, it's not. I'm actually a historical archivist. It's, I've been doing it for over 10 years now. Uh, a career that um, actually led me into Lego classes because I was working on a project when I came up with the first Lego classes and I was just doing it in my spare time. The John Bennett and the BSA are very familiar with um, the collections that I work on because primarily where the connection why I first asked John Bennett to join the family was because I was working on a collection that was donated to the school uh, back a couple of years ago now, I think probably about three years ago now. And um, I thought, because um, you might be interested to see the kind of work that I put uh, work on, and this is through my manager, Lynette Jensen of the Lynette Jensen Collections, who collects, oh, that's the wrong drawer. The Lynette Jensen Collection, who, um, who curates and collects antique engravings relating to the um, classical Greek and Roman world. Here, um, I, she very kindly allowed me to show you tonight a uh, piece that collection that we're still working on. That is a, a collection will be going again to the BSA on landscapes of Greece before it was in, uh, before it was industrialized. So we're seeing much more natural landscapes before um, townships built up and uh, more industrial industries built up. These engravings date back to the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. And this is just a very tiny fraction of what is now being worked on as we speak. But um, I'm very glad that um, Lynette allowed me to show you a small piece of it tonight. And um, I hope John is just a little bit excited because she was very specifically wanting to put this together for him. The other thing I put together as well on my own personal collections of um, my past uh, discipline is as a filmmaker and I got into um, archival through being the archivist for Greater Union here in Australia. And Greater Union is a, a, a cinema chain that dates um, back to the early days, almost to the origins of cinema. And I was very lucky to be offered a job as an archivist and how I started it. And it's how I came across the um, film poster genre, uh, sorry, uh, um, 
aspect ratio of um, the day bill poster, which has got links to, to the world's first feature film. So I found that absolutely fascinating. And I now put collections together on Australian day bills for that connection. Here tonight, I'm just showing another collection that I'm putting together on uh, ancient Greece. Here we've got the um, 1960s film Atlantis. This is an original day bill from the time period. The um, day bill is uh, all day bills. I find fascinating for the reason of their original connection to the origins of cinema. Um, and one, I think it's, although it's specifically a, a format poster that is only seen in Australia and New Zealand, I think every country should be interested in this because of its connection to the beginnings of cinema and it being the world's first poster format to advertise a feature film. And that is something we can all empathize with. And there is something so beautifully in its garishness and all posters are garish, but in their garishness, there's something very wonderfully magic about wanting to see a film and seeing those magical posters up in the cinema. And I think it's just something that can't be replaced. So those are little historical collections that I put together myself as an archivist and um, working for as an independent archivist for Lynette Jensen. Um, I think I, I think I've gone through a majority of stuff. John, do you, do you have any questions that you think that could be answered at this point or have I covered too much? Well, we have we have a question from the floor, as it were, and that is, Excellent. do you take commissions? OK, that's a good question, actually. The answer is I take suggestions. I never take commissions. The major uh, philosophy of Lego Classicists is every single figure is absolutely 100% a gift. I do not accept money. It is all out of my own cost, but I'm always, always happy for people to suggest a new member to the family. Um, the choice always comes down to mine in the end uh, because I, the, 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 the choosing process is just simply after I research the person, if the person's work and style and personality engages me. I and um, it tells me something about the their work in a way that I haven't seen before. Then, without a doubt, I bring them into the family. So I think related to that is is, a, is there a process for um, nominating a particular Lego classicist? There is no official process. No, I. Uh, I am literally who chooses who comes in. Um, however, um, over the course of the years, I have had several people suggest people to join and more often than not, I haven't found many opportunities where I've said no. Uh, the, for instance, every single member you see, um, a Lego Classicist member you see who the real their real selves work at the British Museum. Not a single one of them have been my idea. They've all been mostly suggested by one person and one or two from a couple of other people. And I want to say her name, but I'm going to mispronounce it, but I would prefer to actually mispronounce her name so she knows that I am actually recognizing her. But Duku um, from the British Museum, who is a conservator there, there. She's a very good friend of mine now that another reason why I say that Lego Classicist's family is very much a genuine word that she and I have become very close, even though we've never physically met. And she's always got the most amazing stories and most amazing suggestions to add to the family. Um, another question that, that that's come up is how's COVID-19 affected your either your workflow or your sort of communications with uh, with the, the people you either de design or the people you uh, um, deliver to? It's, um, it's a combination. It, in many ways, it hasn't affected my process at all as far as um, designing, um, but it has every time that I need to, because a majority of the Lego, when I do order Lego into Australia, it is coming outside of Australia. And Australia is an extremely isolated country. Like even um, 
ordering anything uh, from Australasia can take up to a couple of weeks, even before COVID um, hit us. And so on average, now trying to order any parts in can take what used to be a couple of weeks can take up to a month. So I'd say the only thing is it slowed down, which is why over the course of the last year, there have been less figures that entered the family over the last year. But it hasn't slowed down my want and it hasn't slowed down my inspiration. And um, there are quite a few figures just about to be released at the moment um, over the next couple of weeks that sh you should be seeing, including, uh, of course, um, the special figure that I release I, every year. I release a special figure just for the day itself. And um, they will be being released tomorrow on um, interna my, interna my time, International Lego Classism Day. Great, thanks. So I think there was another question actually, is um, is there anything you're working on particularly right now? But I guess all will be revealed tomorrow. So uh, people should uh, should uh, stay tuned to International Classicism Day. Um, Absolutely. Um, and, the, and a related question, I think you may have an answer to this. Um, is there a list of the entire family and, and is there a way of seeing a picture of all of them? The, there's currently no comprehensive list online, but you can see them all on social media because at this point in time, um, it's only ever been on the three, three forms of social media, being the original, form, uh, original one was Facebook, then Instagram, and then Twitter. I think, if I remember correctly, you should be able to see all the figures on Instagram it's just requiring to scroll all the way through and keeping account. I have, um, from today onwards, officially released, for a long time I've been wanting to, an actual website, which um, you can look up. And uh, I'll, I guess, uh, John, I can give you the link so um, the audience can look it up later. But a comprehensive list I've never really thought about putting up as a whole, just because there are so many particularly in the early days as well, there are so many people who would not be relatable to everyone across the world. So I try to keep the majority of what's seen as the most relatable to a worldwide audience by way of engaging with a more universal audience, because it's not just about the classical world or, uh, or the ancient history world that I like to try to engage with. It's also just normal everyday people I want to be engaged. I want people to, I've had people say that they've never been interested in ancient history before. And by reading some of the posts that I put up on a new member to the family, they've said that they've actually learned something today. And because of that kind of feedback as well, I like to try to keep it as a very approachable family in the on the social media or um, a public domain of using the internet um as far so to uh, i know that's a well uh, <laughs> a roundabout way of answering the question but the answer is really i don't know if i will release a 100 percent definitive list at any point but as the website develops um, there will be more and more of the percentage of the family being put up there or at least a list of them as well Sort of related to that, um, one of our correspondents is, is curious, uh, first of all, how many you usually make a year? And if you carry on at that rate, how soon are you going to run out of wall space? <laughs> That's a very good point, actually. Um, oh, on average a year, let's see. I'd say the average is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I usually get around about two rows a year done, but the second year was prolific. I got over 40 figures done the second year alone. And I remember just being exhausted that year. And I told myself I'm never gonna do that again because it made a lot of lovely numbers for the family. But I just, I just like, we went from, if I can show you visually, from here to here is the first year, from here to, here was the second year. So you can imagine there's eight in a row of these things. So I think it was close to 50 just in one year alone that year. 
Since then, I tend to just do two rows of eight, which is I can't do the math. Even that math, I can't do all on the top of my head because my dyslexia. <laughs> but two rows of eight is usually an average year. Maybe three. I think um, the year before last was three rows. So 16 to look four a year then. Yeah, about that. Yeah. I think um, I think two rows is a doable, reliable number <laughs> because um, I wanted to do three rows last year, but the pandemic did slow me down quite a lot. But we still reached number one hundred last year, of course, being Stephen Fry. All oh, right, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, question about um, I mean, you've shown us that the the majority of the parts that you use are standard, as it mm. were, if if enormously variable uh, Lego. Yeah. Parts and one of the correspondents is interested whether there's been any feedback um, from the Lego company itself, and thinking, remarking that they should certainly be very pleased to know that they're being used in such a an impressive academic outreach project. I would have to guess that they would be aware of me because I've seen several posts where I've been outed literally to the Lego group, but. I have not heard a single word from them. And I would suspect that is because there is so the, the the Lego custom world is a ginormous world that I'm not I don't really consider myself very deeply a part of, but I am a part of it by creating these minifigures. And even just minifigures itself, I am by no means not the first person to do this. This is something that's been, I remember reading in the Lego history book custom Lego figures have been made since Lego fig minifigures have existed, which is 1978, if I remember correctly, or 1979, depending on which version of the Lego figure you want to accept as the first one. Um, but the, the, as a result, the custom world or the, the audience that it participates in this world is a big one. And I tend to think they play I think they play parent to this and they don't want to play favorites. So I think their official statement is we can't say anything to anyone. So no one else complains that why did you contact them and not me? So I haven't had any word from them, but I take that as a positive thing because they haven't told me that they want me to stop. And I think that's a good thing. Yes, well, long may that continue. Indeed. Um, uh, a couple of questions which are slightly off um, strictly Lego, but um, first of all, um, one of the people watching has a five-year-old with them, and they would love you to show a Greek or Roman god. Um, I think you've already oh. done that with the year, but okay. So we're going to the year, and right, let's bring uh, Jesse. We're going to do a close-up of the year again. So we've got a year here. I'll, uh, I've got another one as well that I've created just recently, but I'll, I'll actually take you through what I decided to do. So I've, I've built this year for our current situation of the world because I got really inspired by um, actually a piece that uh, my manager put together because she brought out an engraving of your gear and turned it into a greetings card to send to people across the world by way of saying, may good health be with you all. Because of course, your gear is the goddess of hygiene and um, preventative medication. And I got inspired by that. And I decided I want to make a Lego one as well, because I think that's such a beautiful thing. And I started thinking about what makes an Igea for now. Like we can think of a very phenial Igea of the past, but I think this one needs to be far more tough and far, like think, I always thought of, uh, you think of those nurses that you see in hospital who are immensely kind, but are immensely, tell you how to get well and if it means you have to do something they'll make sure you do it so this is an idea for the entire community where we've got her wearing her gloves her hand sanitizer replacing the bowl where she milks the snake and her face mask as well but of course um, keeping to the snake still being on her arm because fundamentally she's badass and she's here to protect us so I wanted to modernize her to the current events so it's a uh, very much an alternative reality Igea but um, as I did just recently for um, uh, Valentine's Day last weekend I also created for a very little comical post uh, I did a little Zeus as well so that's um, our little Lego Zeus. Didn't, I didn't really uh, go too beyond uh, <laughs> I just a very iconic figure of green, nice long hair, long beard, 
nice flowing robes and uh, mostly made from uh, existing pieces actually. So the only custom piece and not my custom piece, because as I just said earlier, there are plenty of people who do custom works who sell their works. So, um, and the robe he's wearing is actually from a um, custom fabric Lego accessory producer where this person makes robes and skirts and kilts and capes. And when I saw the robes they were making, I ended up stockpiling these because I thought oh, that's just genius. I can make a Roman, I can make a Senator, I can make a God. And it's just been a really useful tool to have these little robes on hand for when I want to do something that just inspires me, um, get inspired by ancient Greek or Roman history. And I wanted to do a comic retake of something. And I think if I remember rightly, that Zeus was shown with, with a bull, is that right? Alluding to the, uh, the yes. um, Zeus and Europa, which of course brings us back to Crete. And yeah. um, I'm reminded of, of the Lego Arthur Evans uh, figure. I wonder if you, how many oh, yes. historical sort of Lego classes. Uh, historical figures, to... yes. So the historical figures actually date back to the first year because um, in Sydney University, uh, again, where uh, Michael Turner um, uh, was senior curator and he commissioned three major models made out of Lego um, to represent different uh, ancient history um, buildings and locations. And um, because of that connection, he became my biggest inspiration for the family as a whole. And the museum he worked in was the Nicholson Museum at the Sydney University. And so I created, I'll bring it out, a little Lego Sir, Char uh, Sir Charles Nicholson. So we've got him there. I, I don't have a historical photograph so you can see what I based it upon, but that's that was the first time and I, uh, that I made it the last figure of the year and since then it's not exactly um, a committed rule I do but I've ended up every year at around about Christmas time I release another historical figure so we've got Peels the first and then we've got Thomas Hope oh, right. here in his little Greek attire. Fantastic. He is meant to have a little flame coming out of his pipe, but it fell off the other day and I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to reattach his little smoke, but it's of that classical painting. That's always the trouble with these little parts, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they can fall off really easily. So then we've got, who else have we got here? Oh, this one's one of my favorites actually. Agatha Christie. Ah, oh, wow because of her connection with the ancient history world and the books that she's wrote, that she's written, I just thought, how could you not? <laughs> and I remember when I put her up, again, this is where I think it's really important that in the ancient history world, and like a, just by your reaction alone, you got exactly why I did Agatha Christie, but so many people outside of the ancient history industry kept saying, what's she got to do with ancient history? And then I'd explain it to them. And they went, why didn't I know that before? I wish I knew that before. And again, that's why I always want to make sure that as much as this is the niche of niche of niche of Lego creation, it engages with a much wider audience than just who it's honoring. And I think that is very important. Yeah, and I think that alludes to one of our earlier questions about this being a, an academic outreach um, mm. uh, enterprise as much as anything else. I have one, I think it's going to be our final question, I think, and it, it sure. relates back to the, the engravings you showed us. And I don't, okay. know whether, I don't know how embargoed they are, but a very sharp-eyed uh, observer noticed uh, that they think that one of the engravings you showed uh, from the collection that Lynette is assembling uh, for us, um, we have a picture of in the BSA, uh, in the, oh, well. the Hellenic Society slide collection. Um, and I don't know if you can, it's, it was in Oops. the bottom left, I believe. Bottom um, left. So Jesse, if you scan it first. So it would be that one, I think. Um, the person might in the chat reveal that. Um, and I think the question <laughs> was, where is it? Um, and where is it? Okay. We've got our, so I'm, I'm, I don't know the data in intimacy, but that one is Naxos 1839. Okay, great. 
I hope that I hope that has answered the question. We think it may be by William Purser, apparently. <laughs> because although I get the privilege of handling these very precious pieces, the actual um, academic data I know very little of. That is all the great work of Lamette. So <laughs> I um, I tend to try to stay away from that just because every time she tells me. I just go, my head spins every time. And I just go, I'm just going to find a very safe way of putting this into a nice little folder. <laughs> Look, Liam, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you to, to you uh, for sharing your space, literally, and your knowledge mm. and your experience. And uh, also thanks to Jesse for enabling the creative way of using <laughs> you. We're, we're far too used to standard um, heads on screens and so on. So being able to move around in the space was uh, made it a much more engaging, um, <laughs> engaging uh, uh, way. Um, I hope, uh, wish you every success um, with uh, with the enterprise.